Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today we are going to take a look at this Sensui SC1100 tape deck from the late 70s that I bought ages ago from a co-worker and uh, kind of saved it for a rainy day, which it is today, so we're going to dig in. So this is the Sensui SC1100. These were made, according to the internet, between 1978 and 1979. So it is a device from the peak of hi-fi wars, basically. At that time, everybody was kind of trying to compete. And the large manufacturers like Sensui, Marantz, Sony, Pioneer, you name it, there's a lot of them just competed with their hi-fi components. Sensui came up with this direct-o-matic loading system, which is pretty neat. There's a little flap here hiding the heads of this cassette deck, and you basically load a cassette by just pushing it in. And you can take it out like this. So that's pretty cool. And this flap protects the heads from dust and stuff. There was a plastic cover originally that I don't have, to protect the whole mechanism, but that's not really necessary because the stuff that's under here is the most important. This is a relatively basic cassette deck. Power switch, nice clunky as they had back in the day. There's a tape lead-in function. I think that pauses the recording while the tape lead-in passes. I think that's just the timer, basically. We have a nice tape counter that works. We have a selection between CRO2, ferrochrome and normal tape. And we have Dolby noise reduction. We have an input selector between the microphone inputs that these had at the time and the line input. And we have a dual input level potentiometer here and some nice VU meters. So this looks absolutely stunning. That's why my coworker bought it in the first place. I think it is the lowest tier model that Sensui made back in the day. They had the SC3000 and I think even a model above that. And there's also versions in black without the fake wood grain that this actually is. That is the 1110. And then they made an SC1100G version, which has like uh, more rectangular knobs and things and didn't come with the wood grain cover as well. But basically they all used the same mechanism. They just have added functionality for the higher tier models. And on the back of the device, we have a line in and a line out, record and play, some warnings. Serial number 24710034131. 13 watts of power. Uh, this is pre-wired for 220 volts. We're probably going to change it to 240 volts because nowadays most of Europe has 230 volts mains. It passed quality control as well. And we have a DIN socket here, which was quite common back in the day, at least here in Germany. This is actually combining the record and play inputs and outputs in one neat little DIN connector and has a slightly different level than the RCA line level. So before I try to power this on, we're going to take a look inside. We're probably going to have to replace all the belts in here and maybe some capacitors, maybe something else is wrong. I think the whole front meters here are lit so we probably have to replace some light bulbs. We're going to take a look and then see what we have to do. I already removed the screws. There's just four screws on the sides here. And then this fake wood grain, which is just cheaper wood on the inside really, just lifts out. It looks like they took great pride in their fake, I think, walnut wood grain, which is just a plastic layer on top here, printed with wood grain, <laughs> as witnessed by this sticker here, Sensui Simulated Wood Grain Finish. And here's what's inside. Pretty neatly laid out, all separate boards, as was really common back in the day, in the 70s. We have this little power supply board that's connected to our transformer, which in turn is connected to the mains through this board here. And this has a voltage selector, 
which is set to 220. I'm just going to set this to 240 right away because that's going to be less stressful on the components, I think. I see a probably leaky capacitor here, which is also slightly bulging in the power supply rectifier circuitry. There's uh, all these diodes. I think there's eight diodes for two DC rails that this generates and uh, filter capacitors to smooth out the voltage, uh, converting it from AC to DC. Of course, we have the tape mechanism, which indeed <laughs> all the belts, which are obviously supposed to go over these rollers here, are missing. Oh no, they're not missing. There's some remnants of them down there. So we are going to have to clean those out and replace them. This is a light bulb that's supposed to go here, I guess. This is pretty rusty. But other than that, this looks pretty good. This is the main board with these huge low pass filter cans here and the little dedicated Dolby chips, which were kind of modern back in the day. This is the technology they had, the most advanced Dolby system. The original Dolby system was built in here in these little chips, one for each channel. So yeah, nice potentiometers, uh, the VU meters. There's also lights over these. I think the first thing I want to do before I try powering this up is uh, to replace at least this capacitor. I'm, I think I'm just going to replace all the capacitors on this rectifier smoothing filtering board here. It should be accessible through the bottom. I think most uh, devices from that era had a removable bottom plate so you could easily get to the components without taking it apart any further. Yeah, and it looks like we have to remove the screws around the parameter. I think these three screws here are for the front plate, which we are probably going to have to remove at some point as well. But the ones on the sides here and the ones that actually grip should be the ones we need to remove to get the bottom plate off. Uh, overall, it looks in really nice condition, which is a plus, of course. Yep. Ah, nice. You gotta love the times when things were actually built to be serviceable. There's a bit of rust on here and some random dirt. Doesn't look too bad. But this looks like something leaked on here as well. So maybe capacitor leaked there. We can access our little board here quite well, I think. Should be relatively easy to get the capacitors out of there and replace them. And I'm probably going to end up doing the same with the main board, but I want to take a look at this uh, in action before I do anything with that. Just power it on and see if all the lights work and things like that. The mechanism looks relatively clean, thankfully, even though the belts have turned into goo. The Bottom side of this looks clean from what I can see. Very nicely built. You can see these uh, wiggly lines here because these were all hand drawn basically. The PCB layouts back in those days. And yeah, they just look kind of works of art, which they are kind of. They are hand drawn by people who knew what they were doing, mostly. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to try to reach the uh, capacitors there. This is some old grease that we are going to have to remove and uh, replace with something modern. Let's see if the belts fell out already. No. <laughs> oh, there's one that fell out. <laughs> so one smaller belt, which is super brittle. This just, yeah. And you can see it leaves black marks on my fingers here. So these all disintegrated over the years chemically and there should be remnants of one larger belt for the capstan motor. Yeah, there I can see some remnants of that there. We're going to have to clean this meticulously. I'm probably going to remove this board here, which just plugs in. Yep. And there's Oh uh, yeah, three capacitors on there as well, which we are also just going to replace at this point, I think. This uh, filter cap is definitely bulging a bit, so that is gone. Yeah, I'm just going to replace the filter cap before I do anything else. And the other ones on this small board. I think the capacitors are glued in here, which was relatively common back in the day. This is a 220 microfarad, 16 volts. 
This is another 220 microfarads, 16 volts. The sizes, of course, are vastly different. Technology has advanced slightly. This is the 220 16 volt capacitor, and this is the same value, just a modern cap. I'm using Panasonic FC for the values I have these. These are made to be used in audio equipment, so I also use them for pretty much everything else. Uh, working on vintage electronics. These are low impedance caps, so they mostly work for basic capacitor replacement for all kinds of purposes. They are not uh, very low ESR, as many of the modern caps are. They didn't have extremely low ESR caps back in the day, so these are a good compromise. Panasonic FC series. I never, basically never ran into any issues with these replacing capacitors in these older devices. And of course you want to use the same capacitance values, you can go slightly higher with the voltage rating. Just doing one by one, placing them in the correct orientation and soldering them in. While I have this sitting on its side here, that should be relatively easy to do, I guess. Yeah, these are glued in, of course. you want to glue them in for devices that uh, naturally move during use because they have motors in them. Oh, that seems to have corroded the pads underneath as well. So we're going to have to do some cleanup work on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, this definitely was leaking capacitor. So this was the one with the crud on top here and the slight bulge. And as you can see, the positive lead is completely corroded away. So yeah, it was only held in with the negative lead here. So this didn't do anything to filter the voltages, which probably was a problem. I uh, hope nothing else got damaged down the line. Uh, I'm just going to clean up the circuit board as good as I can. Just going in there with some alcohol and the brush. I'm also going to do some cleaning from the top side. Yeah, but thankfully this cleans up rather nicely. Yeah, this is uh, the top side here. I'm going to try to clean that off. It definitely leaked underneath the capacitor there. It was probably stuck in here for decades. Yeah, if you have something like this in the power supply section, it's definitely not going to help the other components because the voltage, uh, it, it's going to have a lot of AC in it still, because one of the main filter caps was basically out of business here. And maybe we're going to have to run a wire, because this solder joint is completely corroded. Yeah, I'm going to try to use a fiberglass pen here. Oh, actually the pad is not too bad. It's just corrosion on top there. So this here is the pad in question. I already cleaned it up a bit with the fiberglass pen. And it's still completely there, which is a good thing. So we can definitely solder to that. And if it was corroded completely, we could still use the next connection down the line and solder a jumper wire to that or something like that. But I don't think we have to, which is nice. It doesn't look as bad as I anticipated. And the surrounding components all seem to be fine. It just leaked straight down. Yeah, there's some crud inside the circuit board. Just using an awl here to clean that off. Yeah, but there we are. That's all our capacitors, is it? I think so. And as I said, I'm going to replace all the capacitors in this eventually, I think. Because they are from 1978. Oh, the motor actually says July 1977. So this is possibly even older than that. So uh, the capacitors are definitely old enough to be considered a risk. And as usual, these are single-sided circuit boards. In audio equipment, you often still find single-sided circuit boards because they don't need many ICs most of the time, so they don't need a lot of connections. I think this board is for the auto stop and things like that. So I think there's a timing capacitor in here, which is probably this 100 microfarad one. 
that is responsible for the auto stop and if that doesn't work that's probably the culprit because that's used to charge uh, over time time the auto stop so now i'm just going to plug this back in so let's see i think at this point i might try to just turn this on plugged in let's flick the switch oh it actually lights up that's nice the tape counter is lit we have a light on one of the VU meters, the other one is out. We would have a light on this here to see how far the tape has advanced behind the little window that's in those cassettes, which is a super nice feature, but that doesn't work. I think that's the little bulb we saw dangling there. But at least the power's on, nothing smokes. Let's see. Power. Okay, the motor turns, we get an auto stop. We get an immediate auto stop there. Don't know if that's what it's supposed to do, but probably because the motor doesn't have any resistance. That seems to work. I think the next step is see if we can get those belts replaced. Because without the belts, obviously the whole mechanism isn't going to move at all, which yeah, it didn't, as you've seen. The next step is going to be the belt mechanism and that's going to be the most tedious. These have a tendency to turn into uh, like goo, like tar, very sticky black substance. And we have to clean the remnants of the old belts out of the mechanism before we do anything else. I think for that purpose, I'm going to take off the front plate to maybe have better access to some parts of the mechanism. I can see some pieces of the old, the main belt, the capstan belt that connects the uh, flywheel to the motor, which is the main means of uh, transporting the tape. So that's the main belt, that's a wider belt. I already got some replacement belts from web spare parts. No idea how good these are, but we are going to see. Uh, yeah, in order to clean this out, I'm just going to take the faceplate off. I think there's three screws here, three screws on the bottom. We're going to have to pull these knobs, which I think I just pull out. Yep. And this is, of course, a two-stage kind of knob. And yeah, I'm going to put these somewhere safe here. We can also clean these meticulously. And then we should be able to remove the screws and I think the switches can stay in place. Uh, there's going to be a lot of cleaning with Q-tips and I'm going to use acetone to get the debris of the belts from the wheels there, from the metal wheels, the plastic wheels. I'm going to use alcohol to not damage the plastic too much. The acetone is probably just going to melt right through that. But on the motor, the main motor shaft is actually uh, metal. so can use acetone on that. I've heard that uh, for removing the tar, you can also use WD-40 if you clean it afterwards. Uh, you don't want WD-40 on where your belts go because it's slippery. <laughs> but I'm just going to try with acetone and alcohol and Q-tips and a load of patience. Think some of the belt parts are still just everywhere. Yeah, now the faceplate, we can take that off. Now the whole faceplate comes off. Oh, and our VU meter is actually connected to that. Okay, mm, that's unfortunate. And yeah, the tape mechanism, which is the part I really wanted to get to, has another cover that we can remove, I think. So let me just do that as well, and then clean this stuff out. They seem to be glued in place. Yeah, they're definitely glued in. So yeah, that's not going to happen, but we can still remove these screws here around the mechanism, I think. There's four screws that hold this bezel in place that covers the whole head assembly and mechanism. And these are all the same screws, it seems, thankfully. 
which is going to make things considerably easier. And I think there's another belt in there. I can see that from the top here. Oh yeah. Okay, that just lifts out this part here. So here's our mechanism. Yeah, there's some black goo probably from the belts and you can see this belt here is still in place, super loose. And I think this one is the one responsible for the auto stop function uh, that's connected to, is that the counter belt? Yeah, there's three belts on the back of this and this one little belt here that we're going to have to replace. And I think I have uh, replacement belts for the ones on the back only. So we're going to have to find a new belt for this. This is too much slack here. This is definitely too old. Yeah, lots of cleaning. But it's a good thing that we removed this so we can look at the mechanical parts here and give that a good cleaning as well. And we can also clean the heads better, replace this belt, clean out the belts uh, or the remaining stuff that's in there from the other belts on the other side and then put the new belts in. That's going to be fun. So this is the back side of the mechanism. I'm just going to use a pair of tweezers. Here's a part of the belt over here. This is a piece of the original capstan belt. Look at what consistency, yeah. That's how these, uh, these belts disintegrate. It's basically a very sticky, slimy, tarry <laughs> substance. And that, of course, went everywhere in this mechanism here. So, yeah, we're going to have to do a lot of cleaning. <sighs> Q-tips and acetone. And this doesn't really dissolve with uh, alcohol. I think I might even want to wear gloves for this, because this stuff is super nasty. And so is the acetone, you don't want that on your skin as well. So yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. And basically uh, I'm just going to clean the metal parts with acetone and the plastic parts with alcohol Q-tips. Try to get the remaining parts of the belt out of there. I can see quite some parts in there. So uh, this is the flywheel, which you can see turning there. And that, of course, has some residue on it. And also, the worst part is that we have quite a bit of gooey substance in there. Of course, we want to pick these out. There we go. I got a huge chunk. Yay! Blah. And of course, we want to clean this here. This is supposed to be shiny metal. This is where the belt meets the motor. This is the motor. And yeah, of course, the capstan is connected to the motor. And then there's a secondary belt here, which I think is for the counter. And we have another belt here, which uh, goes over this wheel here which which tensions the main belt. So three belts on this side and the small one we saw on the other side. So let me just clean this uh, mess up here a bit as well as I can. This is not going to be very interesting. I'm just going to fast forward the process and let you watch. And this is going to take no time for you, but a lot of time for me. <laughs> huh. Yeah, this is going to be really fun. It's actually not too bad. So I already managed to get quite a bit of this uh, roller here on the motor, the shaft. Just turning it with my hand. And it is a bit tedious, uh, but I don't want to take this mechanism apart any more than necessary. So I don't mess it up, basically. <laughs> so don't want to damage the mechanism because that's the main thing. But yeah, this cleans up rather nicely actually. This is good. But the acetone actually works really well on this stuff. Pretty satisfied with the result. And we're of course also going to clean the mechanism from the front side and probably remove the belt there. That would be a good idea. Yeah, this belt doesn't have any it actually has some sponginess. <laughs> so cleaning the whole mechanism here, or at least uh, I'm not really cleaning the mechanism, I'm cleaning the dust out of this. 
at this point. And the heads are going to be cleaned again. At this point, I'm just cleaning the mess here. I think that's about all the cleaning I want to do on this. At this point, we are going to do some more cleaning, of course. <laughs> So let's find a replacement for that belt that we took out the front assembly there. Uh, I have assortment of belts here that could probably fit this. Oh, this looks pretty much the same. Yeah, that's the belt. So these are just available on eBay, Amazon, everywhere. You can just get the bag of belts. Which, of course, for things like this, is pretty handy. So this goes over here and over here. Yep, and it turns the wheels. Now, for the main belt, we have to get that over this. And there's very little room, even though this whole thing is loose already, because that screw is quite loose there. We are going to have to get that in there. And I think, yeah, I'm just going to loosen this screw a bit more so I can slide a belt over that. I think there's, there should be enough room to do that with some finagling. Just going to take it out. That should give me enough room to fit a belt in there and slide it through that, I think, without disassembling this too much. So just this screw here needs some loosening. So here's the new belts from the kit. And as you can see, this is how the main capstan belt is supposed to look. This is for the tension wheel, I think, and this is for the counter, or the other way around. I think this is the tension wheel, the longer one. And the one you don't get in these uh, like random assortments of belts is a wider belt. You could get away with using a belt that has the same size. I believe this is 7.8 inches, I read in some forum originally. You can use a, a smaller belt, obviously, that is not as wide, but it's not going to last as long and not going to have as much grip. So it's better to use this one, which is roughly five millimeters wide. So I'm not sure if I can give you any decent perspective on this. I probably won't be able to. I'm just going to try to use a I have some dental tools that are really, that are like little hooks and things. Let me get those out so I can probably feed this in there. I have this with, which has like a hook shaped part on it, which might come in handy for an endeavor like this. Probably going to be able, yeah. So this has to go down there. Yeah, I think we're pretty much in there. Okay, now we can put this over here. Yeah! I think that's in. Yeah, that was the worst part. And if you turn this, it should kind of self-center, which it does. Nice. So I just loosened this screw here and then slid the belt underneath and used my dental tool can use other stuff here, probably a screwdriver would do if you have enough patience. And then we have to slide it in there. And there's a little white plastic thing that you can probably barely see that we have to get past. And then we are in and can just hook it over this thing here. And that's all there's to it. The other belts should just be kind of a piece of cake in comparison. <laughs> and of course, at this point, we can re-tighten our screw, which just holds this little uh, cable tie thing in place as well. Yeah, that's in there nicely. So that's our main belt replaced. Let's do the other ones. So we have our tension belt that actually goes from here to here and pushes this wheel that is tensioning. Okay, so this goes over that and over the motor shaft. And this is spinning this as well when the motor is turning. And then we have this wheel that goes to the counter 
That should go over this part here and over this. Yep, and it straightened itself out. The longer belt goes from this wheel to the capstan motor and pushes down on this large wheel here. That's the tension belt and we have this little counter belt. That's the smaller belt that goes from this small roller to this that is connected to the counter. So let's see if we get movement. So one of the moments of truth. Let's plug this in and see if we get a movement on the cassette mechanism. Turning it on. Okay, we get play. And the VU meters also work. That's nice. Yeah, the auto stop is a bit too much there. So this is rewind that just stops play works. And we even get the view meters to show me something. Fast forward also works. Rewind not so much and it auto stops. Yeah, it doesn't really do anything. It turns the motor, but it doesn't turn my wheels here. So that probably needs some lubrication and some cleaning. Counter seems to work. Maybe add some silicon lubricant in there. The motor is a bit stuck in the... It should turn the other way around when I Rewind, shouldn't it? I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. Ah, I see. This should move this, I guess. And this has some issues here. So this is for the rewind. To put some lubricant in there. Okay, that's how it works. So this tiny little wheel here is for the rewind. That engages when I push the rewind and turns this here. And that's all a bit stuck. So I put a bit of lubrication in there. And now it still auto stops. But it's a whole lot better. So we have to clean that a bit here. I think there's some gunk in there. This one works really well. This is fast forward, of course. The rewind kind of, sort of, starts working. Uh, we're going to have to lubricate this some more, I guess. Possibly we have to remove this and clean it. There's a little E-ring in there that we could prob probably get out and remove the whole thing and then put it back. That would probably be a good idea. I don't have a proper tool for this, of course. I'm not sure what I'm what I can use to get this thing off. Dental tool? There it went, flying. Yeah, didn't find it yet, but I'm going to have another look. Now we can take this whole thing out. I'm going to clean the shaft there. This thing is supposed to spin on. And it has little washers from both sides. Okay, the little washers shall not be lost. I'm probably going to use uh, like silicon oil here. I'm just going to put a dab of grease on here, the dab of grease on here. This is just standard silicon grease. So it's back on without the earring because I still didn't find it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit better still. It kind of seems to help. Probably still some lubrication issue there. Still not perfect. It somewhat works better. I actually didn't take into account that the rewind works slightly differently than the fast forward. Everything that goes in the forward direction is directly hooked up to the tape counter. And I think that is hooked up to the auto stop mechanism. So when we put a cassette in, the rewind actually somewhat works now. And the counter is also actuated. We can leave this and it rewinds. It's a bit slow still, so there's still some lubrication needed, I guess. But at least it works. That's pretty nice. 
but yeah, basic functionality is here. Rewind is super flaky still. Fast forward kind of works. And I think the auto stop just happens because this isn't turning the counter here. That's the thing that actuates the auto stop mechanism, I think. Because if this tape stops rolling, this is going to stop and that's probably what engages the auto stop. Probably needs some proper cleaning still and some more lubricant. I'm kind of curious if uh, the outputs work, so I'm just going to give the head or the heads a good scrubbing. They seem to look pretty, They're, they have not that much wear. They are a bit dirty. And you basically just use isopropanol and a Q-tip, just with, uh, just like with everything else, basically. This is the erase head, the smaller one, and the center one is for playback and record. Just going to go over the mechanism again and again, I guess, and maybe the rewind starts working correctly. Just let me hook up some speaker here, I think, and then try if we get something from the tape. After another late shift of meticulously cleaning the whole mechanism from this side and from the other side and also using gallons of lubricant, especially on the flywheel shaft, the capstan, and on the motor bearing, on the front motor bearing, I somewhat got this back in operation. Everything seems to work, it seems to run steadily. The speed seems to be about right. I don't have the necessary equipment, i.e. test tapes, to really test it for speed accurately. And I don't have, I, I need to get some proper test tapes to uh, see if everything is set up, if the azimuth is set up correctly and things like that. Can't really do that with what I have at hand at this point. But at least it's playing, it's reversing, it's fast forwarding, the auto stop works, I can record stuff, the VU meters work, the counter works, all the electronics seem to work, so we can set the tape to different tape types and it slightly ch changes the sound output just as it is supposed to. I can switch Dolby on and the sound for a non-Dolby recorded tape uh, sounds a bit muffled, which is normal. Uh, I didn't check the input selector, but that's just a simple switch between two different uh, inputs. I guess that is going to work fine. Unfortunately, I didn't find my little lock ring here, so I made a makeshift one from a resistor leg, actually, that I wound uh, around this here to hold this pulley in place and uh, just twist it a bit at the end, which works fine, but I'm still going to look out for a proper size this is a very small lock ring, so I'm probably going to get myself an assortment of lock rings. They're not super expensive, obviously, these are common parts, and I think this is just a metric size, like a 1 mm or 2 mm, 1.5 mm, I don't know. But I'm just going to get an assortment and get the proper lock ring on there. Yeah, I figured out some stuff about the mechanism while I was cleaning it, so I just wanted to share this. This wheel here, has two rubber rings, one on the front and one on, on the back. And the back one, if you put this in uh, fast forward or reverse, just contacts the flywheel directly and then turns this here. And this changes sides. So this is fast forward. It contacts the rubber on this wheel here and turns that. And if you put it in reverse, it contacts my little wheel with the lock ring missing and that contacts this. So it needs another wheel to turn the other way, basically. Just simple mechanics. And this just uh, turns the rubber that is around this and then rewinds the tape. So that's how that mechanical part works. The auto stop is pretty interesting because that is connected to uh, this little pulley here that is directly connected to the flywheel, basically, over another pulley and the counter. And let me show you on the other side what actually engages the auto stop. So this here is my auto stop. This is a magnet, I think, a ring on this pulley here. 
which is connected to the same wheel that the counter is connected to. And that spins whenever the tape is moving, this is going to spin. And here's a little, I think it's a, it's a kind of read switch, a magnetic switch that just turns off whenever this stops. So uh, that is then connected to the electronics that are on this upright board here, which the capacitor charges up and that actually it's a real stat that's under here and that just mechanically uh, pulls a piston and that stops the tape. So that's kind of over-engineered, but it works really, really well. So whenever the tape is not moving, the auto-stop is engaged. Pretty clever, but also kind of over the top, I guess. And this whole board here is for the motor controls and also the auto-stop feature. And I think it also manages that uh, tape lead-in feature that I still haven't tried, but you're not really going to need that. But uh, in case on your Sensui tape deck uh, your auto-stop doesn't work, it might be one of the belts connected to the counter. It might be the counter it's itself. I lubricated that quite a bit because it wasn't really smoothly turning. Now it does. Uh, but chances are that there's a leaky capacitor on this board or one of the little transistors that's on here are uh, shorting out or something like that. So that's the main culprit if something is wrong with your auto stop or your tape lead in function or something like that. Before I put the front part back together, let me just briefly show you this thing in action because it is quite magnificent. So tape loads in with this uh, directomatic loading mechanism. We have lights on both the VU meters and the tape counter. We don't have a light here yet. We're going to replace the bulb for that and there's going to be some workarounds involved in that. But I can play the tape, the VU meters work. I tried this with the tape that I recorded, an old mixtape. Uh, that I recorded to be zero decibels and they even seem to be pretty accurate. And we can also rewind the tape, it works really smoothly now, and fast forward the tape, which works even better. Rewind is still a bit slower than the fast forward, I think because my little pulley there has the lock ring missing, it's a workaround kind of situation. The pinch roller, which is here, and just grabs the tape together with the capstan that needs replacing at some point that's pretty worn out. The heads look pretty good. <clears throat> Again, as I said, I can't really test the adjustment of the heads properly at this point. I'm going to do that later when I have the equipment. I'm going to order some test tapes probably. But yeah, basic functionality is restored. It sounds reasonably good. I just connected a little speaker <laughs> to it now. I'm not going to play any music here because of copyright reasons, obviously. You have to trust me on that. The electronics seem to work. I'm still going to replace all the capacitors in there. But yeah, I'm pretty happy that uh, after a lot of lubrication with different oils, and lubricants, I got this to work reliably again. Hopefully it's going to last a while. So speaking of lubricants, I used like a fine machine oil for the parts where there's metal bearings like the capstan and the motor. This is just a generic fine mechanic oil for sewing machines basically. And then I used uh, some silicon lubricant for the parts where there's plastic rubbing on metal or plastic on plastic, uh, like pulleys and things. And I used some silicon grease for the mechanical parts that move up and down and things like that in this mechanism here. You can see there's quite a bit of movement whenever you actuate something. And that seems to have done the trick, thankfully. So everything's back in operation. Yeah, couple of things left to do. And by the way, I'm sorry I didn't show the whole process of the lubrication, but uh, there was a lot of swearing involved and a lot of testing and retesting and re-retesting the tape mechanism. It took a long time before it worked, but eventually I got it. So, uh, yeah, let's take care of this broken lamp here. This is clearly burned out. You can even see the filament there is uh, gone. And actually this sits in a kind of a gasket in this metal part in the hole here and just sticks out to a light pipe that is connected to the front bezel on the tape mechanism there. 
and then the light is transported to behind the tape, which is pretty clever. Again, super nicely designed. But I'm going to have to make a makeshift uh, gasket for this to hold it in place for my replacement bulb that I'm going to put in there. These are 12 volts bulbs, uh, the ones behind the VU meters and this one. The one behind uh, the counter is actually an 8 volt bulb. I'm going to link the service manual in the video description so you can check that out yourself. They are different bulbs for the VU meters and for this, but all 12 volts and one uh, kind of pill-shaped light for the counter. And these are, as usual, for these 70s devices, these are AC powered, so we can't really just replace them with LEDs. We would have to do some finagling. And also, I don't really like the light of LEDs in these devices because they are not at all period correct. There is the record LEDs, actually, it's an actual LED in this one, but uh, the lights for the dials and things and uh, counters usually were uh, incandescent bulbs like these. So I think what I'm going to do is to see if I have a suitable replacement for this and uh, clip this one off the leads here and just solder on a replacement to see if that lights up and if it's bright enough. I think I have a couple of options there. I don't think I have the exact same lamp unfortunately but we're going to find something that lights up at least and then we're going to have to fit it there some somehow. So this just needs to go because it's clearly burnt. By the way, this is how many Q-tips I used for cleaning. Literally took the whole evening into the night. I think it was one o'clock at night when I finally got this to work more reliable. So that's what it takes. Lots of patience, lots of cotton swabs. So I got quite a few of these 14 volts lamps that I think are going to be suitable for this purpose. They are going to light up when you apply 12 volts, I guess. Don't even remember what I bought these for. But you can get these uh, 12 volt miniature lamps. They are still readily available. They're used for like model trains and things. This is the exact same size as the one that was in there before, three millimeter diameter, I think. It's going to be the, the wrong voltage but it's still going to light up, hopefully. So I think I'm just going to strip these wires, the original ones, and solder this on for testing, just to see if it lights up at all. And of course, the polarity doesn't matter because it's AC. And it's not going to be a work of art because it's just for testing the light itself. Okay, I connected my bulb. Let's see if it lights up at all. When I turn this on, Yes, it does. Actually, it does look pretty appropriate. Appropriate. So I'm just going to come up with a solution for this gasket type of thing there. Probably just heat shrink tubing, maybe cable tie. So I'm just going to put a bit of heat shrink tubing over that. And the original gasket covers the light more or less fully. Just the tip of it is reaching through. So I'm just going to try to put my heat shrink here and then we're just going to shorten these and connect them properly. Maybe we need a couple of more layers of heat shrink tubing so that this holds in place a bit better. But I think you get the idea. Just going to shorten this and put heat shrink tubing over the wires obviously to protect them from shorting out. And that should be the way to do it. You probably can't see very well. <laughs> I'm just soldering the wires to the other wires on the bulb, so there isn't much to see and I'd rather do this without the camera in the way. Yep, that also looks good. Yay! It still lights up. And now I'm just going to add heat shrink tubing over this until it fits. Let's see, does it still light up after my heating up? Yay! <laughs> and more importantly, it also transports the light here, which is the purpose of this light. So that seems to be fixed as well. Nice. And I think I'm just going to use a cable tie to kind of fix it in place a little better. 
this should work nicely. That's kind of perfect. Ta-da! And it's not even moving with the cable tie in place there. So several layers of just heat shrink tubing on that. It's also out of the way of the mechanism. It's all good. That's fixed. So the last thing I really want to do to this is to replace all the electrolytic capacitors on this main board, which is the sound board, basically. The other stuff is the motor board, more or less, and the, as I said, the controls for the auto stop and things like that. But the, all the audio processing, Dolby stuff, filtering, switching of different tape types and stuff is uh, done on this board. So it would be a good idea to replace all the capacitors on there. And why not do it now while I'm here anyway? I am going to revisit this and set it up properly, but I can do the work I can do now. <laughs> Just going to mark all the old capacitors with a red dot, I think, so I don't get confused because there's quite a few on there. That's a lot of capacitors. <laughs> and I'm just going to mark these and take some pictures of the board because we want to get the polarities right and you never know with these boards if the markings on the board are actually correct. I think I should be able to reach all these caps through the bottom plate. So basically the same procedure as with the little power supply board and the auto stop board. I'm just going to replace one capacitor at a time. I'm going to use good brand new capacitors, uh, Panasonic FC in this case, mostly for the very small values like below one microfarad and one microfarad. I'm going to use uh, polyester film capacitors because they work well in audio circuitry usually and they last basically forever. So that's going to be nice. Uh, let me fire up the desoldering station. I don't think there's much to talk about. I'm just going to do it and show you the result or maybe a time lapse. <laughs> I think I possibly got them all. That's a lot of capacitors. <laughs> Maybe it's even worth it. I'm not sure if it's worth it for a tape deck, but these are definitely uh, 46 years or 45 years at least old. And these components age and it is probably a good idea to replace them. Some of them look quite bulgy and, uh, and some of them there was some kind of crud on the bottom seal. So some of these have definitely leaked over the years. So I suppose it is a good idea to replace all of them, if in doubt. I'm just going to clean the circuit board up from the solder side, clean up the solder residue and then try if uh, this thing explodes when I turn it on. That's what you get with these old circuit boards. There's lots of old uh, flux on there as well. And probably some dirt from way back when. Yeah, that should do. And here's my new capacitors. Uh, most of them are a fair bit smaller than the original ones. And as you can see, I put uh, these white square ones and the red square ones are my... Oh, I actually missed one over here. <laughs> These square ones, I wanted to say, I'm going to replace that as well. These square ones are my polyester film capacitors, one microfarad and I think a 0.33 microfarad one, this one here. But the other ones are all same value electrolytic capacitors, just good ones. Okay, one last capacitor. It's this one, I think. 
and it's another 0.33 so we can use another MKS these are. MKS polyester. The red ones are Wima brand, really good brand. Uh, the other ones I'm not sure which brand if any. <laughs> there we go, that should be the last one now. Okay, now let's go for the smoke test. I didn't see any other capacitors in there that I didn't replace, I think. Uh, conveniently, all the capacitors point, the, the negative lead of all the capacitors points in this direction. So there's not much room for failure in that regard, getting the polarity mixed up. And also the polyester caps, of course, are bipolar, so they don't have a polarity. I hope they work fine. I didn't look at the circuit schematics or anything like that, but uh, should be, we should be good. Fingers crossed. So plugging in, flipping the on-off switch. Okay, nothing exploded so far. That's good. Let's load the tape. Play still works. Our review meters still work. I suppose I'm just going to let this run for some time and listen to some more of my mixtapes while I clean the knobs and uh, the bottom plate. And I think I'm going to give the top part of it the uh, wood. It is wood, but it's fake wood grain. <laughs> I'm going to give that another good cleaning too. And then I'm going to put it back together. That was quite the journey. The capacitor, the recapping in the end was quite a bit of fun. Most of the times while recapping things like this, I get in a kind of meditative state and uh, I really enjoy that for some reason. It's really soothing my nerves. I hope this wasn't for nothing. At least it still does things and the auto stop should engage now. Yeah. The auto stop engages whenever the tape stops moving, even in fast forward or reverse, which some modern tape decks don't do. I'm just going to hook up the speaker again and listen to some stuff here. It still plays and I think it sounds a whole lot better than before, so probably the recapping wasn't for nothing that improved the sound output significantly. All the functions still work. We get uh, the different tape types to sound differently. Dolby sounds a bit muffled of course because this tape wasn't recorded with Dolby engaged. It does seem to still work fully and we get sound and it runs steadily. Not going to be able to let you listen to a lot of this because copyrights probably don't want to risk copyright strikes on YouTube. But uh, trust me, this thing works beautifully. And the light here is actually quite useful because you can see the tape advancing much better with the light shining behind it there. So yeah, we seem to be fully back in business. One thing I completely forgot, I'm going to put some hot glue on these larger caps where there was glue originally because uh, there is the motor right next to them. I'm probably also going to cable tie these cables together. Yeah, some minor little things that I want to do. Uh, it doesn't hurt to glue these back down and this is a single-sided circuit board so we shouldn't run into any issues with conductive glue or glue becoming conductive if we clear the contacts of the other components there, which should be easy to do because there's a lot of room on these circuit boards. I'm also going to give the heads another clean. This is just plastic, so uh, no need for any kind of wood, oil or anything like that. As we've seen and as they proudly state, this is just fake. was probably more impressive in 1977 to have fake wood grain that looked original. The knobs just get a quick wipe with some isopropanol. And I'm going to put this dual thing here on here while this is turned to zero. So I'm sure that it's the correct position. This should be centered. Yep. Like this. 
This should be perfectly centered now. I think that's back together. Yeah, I hope this was informative and maybe even a bit entertaining. I'm going to be back with more retro computer stuff really soon and then I'm going to take another look at this as soon as I have the correct equipment for that. I always enjoy working on these. I hope you enjoy watching these uh, vintage hi-fi restoration type videos as much as I enjoy making them. Thank you so much for your support on Patreon and on the channel memberships page and on Coffee and elsewhere. The links are in the video description should you consider giving me some support, which of course would be highly appreciated. Thanks for your thumbs, thanks for your subscriptions, thanks for your comments and hope to see you again on this channel sometime. I'm Jan Beta, thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.